development at this, until the end between 20 to 22 weeks, the normal appearance. What about the anatomy? It is important to consider the anatomy regarding some structure uh, surrounding the corpus callosum and the mm, anterior uh, uh, anatomy in correlation with the lateral ventricles. This is an, an amazing image from uh, our anatomy uh, dissection. And you can see the corpus callosum in the midland. You can see the, the normal correlation with the Cavender septum pellucidum uh, and also in the posterior part, the thalami, and in the anterior part, uh, obviously, the rostrum of the corpus callosum. And uh, I have to say that uh, in the midline, the cingulate sulcus is an important um, structure to, be, to have to be evaluated because it's in correlation with the embryonic and the normal development of the corpus callosum. That means if you do not find the corpus callosum, it is very important that, yeah, that uh, you have to consider that you do not can see the uh, uh, cingulate uh, sulcus. Okay, we are going to move on with uh, the important uh, approach in the midline in the anterior complex and the correlation in the axial planes. We are going to talk about it, the protocol for the ultrasound evaluation of the corpus callosum. And uh, I have to say that for the correct evaluation of the anatomy and the uh, function, I mean, uh, regarding to the anatomy of the corpus callosum, you have to consider to add almost two planes. Maybe, for example, you can use the axial plane and also the coronal planes in all the fetuses for the correct evaluation. You can see here the axial plane, the correlation with the anatomy, and you can see here the carbon septum pellucidi, the septum pellucidi, and in the anterior part, the C form, the C shape of the, of the corpus callosum that is a, a hypoechogenic uh, structure that is very important to recognize in your technique. Then if you move on to the coronal planes, you can see in uh, the caudal plane, in the coronal plane, you can see also the Z shape of the corpus callosum in this approach that is completely normal uh, between two hyperechogenic sulcus that it's important to consider in the normal anatomy of the corpus callosum. What about the function of the corpus callosum? Okay. Uh, regarding to the function of the corpus callosum, you have, uh, you have to remember that it's a structure in the brain that connects uh, the left and the right uh, cerebral hemispheres and is the largest white matter structure in the, in the brain. And it is the most important commissure in the fetal, in the fetal brain. And this is important, the correlation with the fornix. And the fornix is below of the, of the body of the corpus callosum and is a uh, fibrous arching band connecting the two lobes of the cerebrum located uh, uh, beneath of the corpus callosum. That is important, the form is because uh, uh, it's in correlation with the anatomy at the midline and connects the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. Okay, the next important point is the ultrasound evaluation uh, of the corpus callosum, okay? In this point, it is important to go to to, to take into account the ISOC, the last ISOC guidelines, and the convention protocol in the median plane, in the axial plane, and also you have to add, uh, if you need it, the coronal planes. It is important to mention that you can use the transabdominal approach and also the transvaginal approach. And uh, in the conventional protocol, you can see here, for example, the typical appearance of the uh, corpus callosum in the midline, and uh, uh, as I told you uh, before, you can see here, for example, the hypohypogenic uh, appearance of the corpus callosum surrounding by an hypohypogenic sulcus. And you can see here the normal cingulate sulcus in correlation with the normal development of the corpus callosum. What about the coronal plates? Okay, if you use the coronal plane, obviously it is important uh, also because you can not only, you can analyze the normal shape of the corpus callosum, the C form, the hyperechogenic appearance, and the prolongation of the anatomic structure in the cerebral lobes. It is important also the evaluation of the surrounding anatomic and normal anatomy structure that is important uh, in correlation, for example, the shape of the carbon septum pellucidum, that is another important point for the 
normal screening, you know, I mean, the abnormal shape of the, of the cavernal deceptum pellucidum can uh, mean abnormal uh, abnormalities in uh, the midline structures in the fetal brain. This is an amazing image for uh, review the normal um, uh, anatomy and the normal parts of the corpus callosum. Remember, the most below anterior part is the rostrum, the anterior uh, uh, part, the genu, the body, and the posterior part, the splenium. And I have to mention, and uh, in the evaluation, another important and other important structures and the commissure. Remember that the, the other commissure in the midline can can be evaluated by ultrasound. For example, the anterior commissure, the posterior commissure, and the hippocampus commissure. It is important for the complete evaluation of the midline structures. Okay, we are going to move on. Uh, with uh, the complete uh, agenesis of the corpus callosum, that is an, an important uh, uh, objective of uh, our session. If uh, we are going to talk about the complete agenesis, we have to mention that the agenesis of corpus callosum is the most common form of the, commiss of the commissural agenesis, almost is the most diagnosed. And the absence of the corpus callosum is in correlation with the possibility of absence uh, of the other commissure, the most uh, frequently is the hippocampus and the anterior commissure. The prevalence is less than 1% uh, in the general population. And uh, also you can find between two to 3% of the cases in patients with abnormal uh, and with me uh, mental retardation. Obviously you have to consider the gestational age for the, the accurate moment for the complete evaluation of uh, the corpus callosum. Let's move on with the physiopathology. Uh, if we compare uh, the possibilities in the, the physiopathology of the abnormalities of the corpus callosum, we have to mention that many uh, genes and genomic loci are involved between 55% to 70% of the cases, uh, ca the causes can not be determined by clinical evaluation, I mean only by ultrasound. You have to use also some genetic tests for improve the possibility to understand the, the cause of the agenesis of corpus callosum. Let me, we are going to review some of the most important um, etiologies, the Silgen gen uh, syndrome between 20 to, 30, uh, to 55 percent of the cases in correlation with uh, abnormal uh, cortical development. That is an important point that you have to consider. The variant numbers, for example, some deletions between uh, chromosome 1 and 24 and between uh, 1 and 36, and also some syndromes without uh, now cause, uh, for example, the Icardi syndrome and no genetic condition, for example, the infection, the uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, and some abnormalities regarding with the gestational age. Okay, move on with the typical approach. Uh, this is the last part of the lecture and the most important point in, in the ultrasound diagnosis. You have to consider in the ultrasound diagnosis the direct sign, and the most important direct sign is the failure of visualization of the corpus callosum on sagittal or in the coronal planes. And also this fibroid in the visualization can be uh, in correlation with some cysts in the midline that is important to evaluate and it's an important uh, uh, image and in correlation with the abnormal, uh, on the absence of the corpus callosum. And also the indirect signs that include the absence of septum pellucidum also uh, obviously, in correlation with the ventriculomegaly, absent in, in the, the cavern of the septum pellucidum in the anterior complex, the abnormal pericardiosal artery, the radial sulci that appear obviously uh, late on the third trimester, the colpocephaly and the typical shape of the lateral ventricle, the parallel ventricles with the absence of the cavern of the septum pellucidum it is a, a indirect sign. You have to analyze the structures in the midline. Finally, you, you also can use the uh, uh, fetal MRI for uh, uh, 
uh, rule out the possibility of some association with the abnormal cortical development. And it is important to consider, for example, uh, another uh, um, associate anomalies. For example, this is a, one case of, from uh, our database with the typical uh, 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 absence of the corpus callosum with uh, the midline uh, uh, arachnoid cyst that is uh, very typical. This is another case with absence of corpus callosum with uh, uh, very huge uh, cysts uh, in the midline. Okay, for the conclusion, for the complete evaluation of the corpus callosum, you must include all, almost two ultrasound planes, and you have to use all the protocol for improve the possibility of uh, the diagnosis of the abnormalities of the corpus callosum, and especially the absence of the corpus callosum. When you uh, find a corpus callosum abnormality, you have to include the evaluation of also the cortical development and other uh, possibilities uh, of uh, for rule out and other abnormalities in the fetal brain. In many fetuses, it's difficult to differentiate between some uh, abnormalities, for example, like partial analysis of corpus callosum or hypoplasia, and you have to improve uh, your techniques for improve the possibility of uh, the diagnosis of the absence of the corpus uh, callosum. Thank for your attention. Thank you, Maurizio. Thank you so much also for keeping strictly to the time so that we try to finish on time. And so I'll try to do my share screen and then we open the, the, the papers and uh, the topic for discussion. So, okay. Okay, here we are. So I will build on the top of what uh, Maurizio has uh, said so far. And I will uh, uh, present you three stories three fetuses, as you see here, three stories and three different outcomes. So let's start with the uh, first, if I can manage. Okay. The first issue is with where we start from, and Mauricio just gave you a long, a long list of conditions. And if you run a search on OMIM about the genesis of the corpus callosum, you have almost a thousand hits. Uh, meaning that the number of, of uh, syndromic condition that may have uh, genesis of the corpus callosum among the uh, they are signed is quite uh, huge. And only a min minimum part of that can be diagnosed uh, nowadays, also after birth, let alone in the fetus. So then let's now see three fetuses uh, that were referred. I call them Alice, Mark, and Anne, as you see here. And they were all referred in the early third trimester due to ventricular megaly and non-visualization of the cavern site velocity. As you see, these are the three images that were taken. All of them had severe ventricular megaly because you know that severe ventricular megaly is anything exceeding uh, 15 millimeters in the diameters of the, of the atrium here. And uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, what is the mid, mid sagittal view? Because this is the actual the diagnostic view for a genesis of the corpus callosum. Because any time that you have a patient or yourself do not see properly the uh, CSP, uh, that's the major sign together with the colpocephalic aspect of the uh, of the trigon of the lateral ventricle to suspect complete genesis of the corpus callosum. And these were the three uh, midline views. Uh, this is Alice's, this is Mark's, and this is Anne's. And you see how uh, in all of, in the three of them, you cannot see the corpus callosum uh, itself. And you have some additional hints that you may uh, consider. So uh, keep in the back of your mind uh, this question. First of all, are all these findings typical for ACC? Or is any weird thing that you may think of in any of these three fetuses? And this applies also to the three previous images, and I couple them together with mitzagittal. So now you have the aspect of the actual and the aspect of the mitzagittal view. Okay. Uh, so if any of you want to uh, make any comment on this, just uh, write it in the chat, and we'll talk about that in the discussion. I just leave you a few seconds for you to consider that, and then uh, I give you the the 
actual question. Is this degree of ventricular megaly exceeding uh, 15, 20 millimeters in all of them typical for ACC in the third trimester? Or do you think it's too much uh, as a colpocephalic aspect? So that's the question you have to ask yourself. And now we follow the stories of the three babies. Let's start with Alice. So this is the coronal view. And I show you three slices uh, along the brain on the coronal planes. And on this view, this is the diagnostic one following uh, uh, the beautiful images by Mauricio before. And you see that it's the typical absence of the corpus callosum, displaying of the two frontal horns, which I'll refer to as bull horns or bicycle handle, as you may wish to put it, or you may just may wish to see. So this just to confirm that you have a complete agenesis of the corpus callosum and severe ventricular megaly. This is uh, um, a temporal horn, which is also dilated. And then uh, I just moved my, my view a bit more frontal. And here is the lateral ventricle. And you see, oops, there's something wrong here. So you have something here coming into the, the, the image. So you see these two bumps that some of you have recognized as possible uh, foci of superpending malheterotopias. So in this case, you have ACC plus superpending malheterotopias. And then I move uh, uh, my, my transducer a bit more frontal again. And this is another image. And you see here two additional findings. The first one, is an abdominal sulcus on the frontal part on this hemisphere, which should not be there. And the second issue is that if you look at the, uh, the two hemispheres here, but also here, they are not uh, same sides. So you have ACC, subependymal heterotopias, uh, uh, abdominal narration, and asymmetry of the hemispheres. So some of you, the bravest among you, have already reached the diagnosis because you have to consider also that this fetus was uh, is a girl. So the question is, what is Alice affected with? Have you reached a diagnosis? These three signs or four signs are quite typical, and we together with Leo Pomar in the multicenter series have described them as the prenatal evidence for an ICARD syndrome. Okay. So in this case, the unfortunate Alice is she's unfortunate because the outcome is very poor for a cardiac syndrome. This is sporadic condition occurring in females. Let's move to Mark, the boy. This is the third ventricle. Uh, again, there was a genesis of the corpus callosum. Have a look at the uh, shape of the third ventricle here. This is the uh, massa commissuralis, the addition between the two thalami portion. And you see here, there is some hint of dilatation of the pineal recess and no evidence of the aqueduct whatsoever. So if you consider that the size of the atrium in this case was 22, if I'm not wrong, uh, and there was dilation of the third ventricle as well, then you see that in this case, you have ACC plus aqueductal stenosis, and it's a boy. So what you would turn next to look outside the brain? Just think a few seconds about that. If you want to write the, 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 a comment or your answer in the chat, feel free to do so. We will discuss it afterwards. And then I give you the, the, the answer. You have to look at the hands because if you have a boy with the genesis of the corpus callosum, or aqueductal stenosis, or both of them at the same time, you may have indeed this very severe condition, uh, the signature sign of which is the adducted thumb that you see here on 4D ultrasound and in the image on uh, after birth. And so the final diagnosis uh, is L1 syndrome, and again, unfortunate mark uh, for, for Mark, the expected neurological outcome is indeed very, very poor also in this case. So if you have usually uh, a good number of cases, they have a positive family history of mental retardation in males. 
uh, but some some of them are prospective cases. So anytime you have ACC and you have a very large uh, ventricle, so that you may think that might be an, an association with the aqueductal stenosis or hydrocephalus, go to the hands, have a look at the hands, and if you see a doctor thumbs, you've done uh, your diagnosis, unfortunately, for, for the poor baby. And that's the second case. And then we left with the third case that you see here. And again, have a look for Anne. This is the third ventricle. So let's study together the third ventricle. And again, as before, if you want to suggest anything that you may think uh, catches your attention or your eye uh, on this uh, third ventricle, just write it in the, in the chat and we'll comment on that later. So have a look. And then again, you see you have two features. The first one, which is a very unusual one, is this. What is this? This is a relative, not so small actually. It is magnified the image because this is the third ventricle, so it's a few millimeters. But that's a cyst in the anterior portion of the third ventricle. And if you consider the three dimensionality of the brain, that cyst is right at the level of the Monroe foramina uh, inlets. So it might well be that this is the cause for the ventricular megaly that this fetus has. And you see here how, yes, you see the colpocephalic here, aspect of the, uh, of the lateral ventricle, but see how large is the ventricle, how wide is the ventricle. So there is some uh, obstruction of the ventricular system. Uh, then, of course, you may have a, a, an idea or doubt that indeed that might be also, or as a primary cause of uh, the ventricular megaly, also an issue with the, with the aqueduct. Because again, as in the previous case, you see this uh, dilatation of the suprapaneal recess, uh, which is typical, and you do not see any hint of the aqueduct, which you should, uh, because some, some pieces of the aqueduct are visible at this gestational age, but there is not, not any, any piece visible. So you may have a, a, a question mark on possible association with the aqueductal stenosis. This was the follow-up, 36 weeks, a, a, a bit more, even more enlarged the, 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 the ventricle. And then the neurosurgeons were just ready to jump on this baby. But this was the postnatal MR at two weeks. And you see the cyst is very well depicted here. But the good news, as you see here, is that if you remember the last prenatal sides of the uh, ventricle was 36, and now they were 20 and 30. So it's slightly decreasing. There is still a question mark on this notch here because the aqueduct is not see patent for the whole of its course, but the baby is still follow being followed now uh, because it may well be that if the cyst regresses, there is no need for shunting or for any other procedure. So uh, among the three of the babies, the three stories, this is the most fortunate or less unfortunate one, because if the ventricular megaly will regress, the diagnosis will be isolated ACC. So you see, uh, we started in all of them with uh, suspicion of uh, uh, weird, ventricular megaly because it was too large, the ventricle for uh, uh, ACC and uh, genesis of the corpus callosum. And we ended up with three different diagnoses. So the question is that when you have to make a, your, find your way uh, in prenatal diagnosis and malformation, you have to play Sherlock Holmes uh, and look at the hints that will lead you to the final diagnosis. And of course, this is elementary for uh, the expert, but it's not so much so for all the people that were, who are enthusiastically learning uh, our discipline, because that's our everyday life. So look at the hints, and they will give you the final answer in most of the cases. Not always, but in most of the cases. And then this leads to the second last part of the, of the talk, and then we open the, 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 the floor for discussion. Uh, what happens with the consultation for uh, in utero for uh, the prognosis of adenosis of the corpus callosum? Well, if we look at the fetal series, 
uh, on, on, uh, on the rate of the neurological outcome and normal neurological outcome, they all keep this number uh, 65, 70 percent of normal neurological outcome. But if you look at the at the meta-analysis, there are two even from the same group published a clear difference. Very good journals, but uh, others uh, are coming and all refer to the small cases of the fetuses. And in that case, the follow-up time is very short. What happens if you delete the term fetus from your search on, on PubMed and look for neonatal or adolescents with much longer follow-up? The advantage in this case is that you have a thorough assessment of all the aspects of the development, not only neurological, but neuropsychological as well. And also, and that's another crucial point, you may have also an assessment of the association with the uh, autism. And this is a major point in the genesis of the corpus callosum. I will cite only paper and then we can discuss the issue. The first one is a very strong uh, Italian group. And you see that if we keep in our mind the 70% figure that is cited of normalcy for the fetal series, you see here that virtually none of the aspect with the exception maybe of uh, the behavior hits the 60 or 70 percent uh, rate of normalcy and this is a, a major point and the other point is if you look at the follow-up that they are commenting in this paper you see that uh, the, this, the distress and the uh, neurodevelopmental delay was becoming evident only later in the second decade of life and this is coming over and over if you look at the good paper uh, addressing this issue. And the same holds true for behavioral difficulties. And this is another crucial point. Almost half of the patient they followed needed a rehabilitation program. So that's not uh, as simple as 70% of normalcy. And the major point is this one, because in this case, uh, because in this case, you see that these two papers had a very high rate of association with the uh, autism. But look here, uh, they follow this these babies across the school stream. And you see that the number of babies in the mainstream, which is normal school, is uh, worryingly decreasing over time. And at the same time, the number of babies needing special care and attention is increasing. So it's not that simple because we cannot sit down and rely on the 70% rate of uh, uh, normal outcome for uh, a genesis of the corpus callosum when we discuss this with our patient and our couples, because the data are out there. And with, uh, uh, with the time after birth, the situation will get worse and worse. So coming back to prenatal diagnosis, uh, again, for as for most of the condition, the major prognostic sign is the association with other abnormalities. Uh, we do need to carry out uh, some genetics, but we cannot restrain to CGHRA anymore. And there is there are uh, strong evidences that exome sequencing needs to be done also for isolated uh, cerebral malformation these days. So if you put a needle in you should ask for uh, exome sequencing. And remember that again, uh, the data that we have so far cited for uh, in our counseling from the meta-analysis I, I showed you uh, are not supported by uh, stronger, well, actually by other uh, studies that with, have, which have a long, much longer follow-up after birth. And so, this is the conclusion, and uh, I open the paper for discussion. Thank you for your attention. And then we can have a look at the question on the chat and any comment from Mauricio to start with, and, and so on and so forth. And stop sharing. Thank you, Dario. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, Dario. Uh, an amazing cases. I think that is a uh, and uh, an amazing three cases with, uh, with uh, uh, all the examples, the possibility of the association with the diagnosis of uh, the abnormal corpus callosum. Dario, we have uh, the first question regarding uh, to the technique for the accurate evaluation of the corpus callosum and the difference in your technique, for example, between where the, where the fetus is in breath position or is in the cephalic position. 
And um, in, the, in the same way, uh, in the technique, is, uh, it is possible to make uh, the same evaluation with the transabdominal ultrasound and the transvaginal ultrasound. It's the same. It's, uh, it is possible the same uh, evaluation. Dario, can you hear me? Mauricio, yeah, my line was unstable, you... sorry. Yeah, can you oh, hear okay, me okay. now? Yeah. No, 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 yes. Uh, we have the first question regarding to the technique for uh, the evaluation of the corpus callosum, Dario. And the first question is uh, regarding to the, to the fetus uh, in the comparison of the breast position and the cephalic position and the approach in the transvaginal and the transabdominal yeah. ultrasound. Can we uh, make the same evaluation with the accurate for the diagnosis in both techniques? Uh, thank you, Mauricio, and thank for, uh, I don't see who, who put it, but uh, thank for the question. Uh, well, of course not, because the resolution is much different, uh, it's completely different if you use transabdominal versus transvaginal. Uh, as published also in the guidelines on Neurosono, uh, I think that with some kindness and gentleness, you can also try to get an external version uh, for the fetus if there is a, a, a breach presentation up to the late second trimester, probably if the woman is compliant and, and if there is enough fluid to try to uh, make this maneuver. Uh, also without any pharmacological uh, tocolytic activity, just on the, on the bed, on the scanning bed. Uh, if this is not working, you have to make do with the transabdominal, but of course you have to consider and you have to express and inform the couple and the patient that in that case, uh, the resolution and so the diagnostic yield of, uh, uh, of ultrasound is significantly lower than if you would if you could do a transvaginal transvaginal neurosono. Uh, uh, we always complement for a genesis of the corpus callosum the examination with the uh, MRI because this is one of those fields in which I think uh, it helps, but of course not at mid trimester uh, later, 26, 28 weeks of gestation when MRI is indeed uh, a performant examination uh, at in the second trimester, we have in Italy a legal termination limit at 22 weeks, but it's very stretching for MR to provide any additional clinical information to uh, transvaginal neurosonal digestational age. That's my, uh, my opinion, at least. Agree. Agree. I, I think uh, also, Dario, that it is, it is important in the technique to add almost uh, uh, two or three approaches, I mean, the slices in the technique uh, for the accurate evaluation of the corpus callosum. I mean, not only in the axial plane, not only in the coronal, and not only in the sagittal. You have to use in any technique, I, I mean, in any approach, transvaginal or transabdominal, you have to use the complementary uh, evaluation for improve the possibility to the diagnosis of the midline structures and especially of the, uh, the corpus callosum. The next question is very interesting, Dario, and I have a lot of questions in my, in my cell phone for many people from uh, Latin America. It's an amazing. Uh, the next question in, in our chat uh, in here in the, in the, in the, in the, in the ISWOC Zoom uh, platform is regarding to the third ventricle and uh, regarding to the differential diagnosis and between the third ventricle and the uh, arachnoid cyst in the midline, which is the best uh, um, advice for make the uh, differential diagnosis? Well, again, that's a very subtle differentiation. Sometimes uh, usually uh, arachnoid cysts are on the top of the third ventricle uh, because the dental ventricle is uh, just, uh, should have been below the corpus beneath the corpus callosum. So uh, usually the triangular aspect of the of the third ventricle is better approached, uh, uh, assessed with the mid-sagittal approach. Uh, on that, you can see the the if there is any dilatation of the suprapineal recess, which may point to a, a concurrent um, obstruction of the aqueduct, maybe. 
uh, or if there is any other hint. The case I showed you with the cyst is a very unusual one because again, in that case, uh, it was really a, a surprise to find this small cyst that could have been responsible for the whole uh, obstruction of the, of the aqueduct. So indeed, I think that rather than going and measuring on the actual plane, the, the, the third ventricle, the key plane, as you pointed out, Mauricio, before, is to go for the misagita one uh, with an anterior approach or through the anosified sagittal suture, as far as the third ventricle is concerned, yeah. uh, and uh, to complement with uh, another approach from the posterior front tunnel. And this will show brilliantly uh, the, the caudal portion of the aqueduct and the posterior fossa, because we should always uh, uh, consider and be aware of the fact that uh, the, the malformation of the central nervous system may occur in couples or even two or three at the same time. And it's a must for us to assess the whole of the, uh, of the brain anatomy, not only the supratentorial part. So it's quite important to have a very good approach and there is a systematic approach also to the posterior fossa to roll out uh, second abnormalities over there. Amazing, Dario. We have time to, uh, two, two minutes more for the last question. And I'm going to, this, this question is, uh, uh, is from uh, Bolivia. And I think that is a, an amazing question. And it's regarding to, we can talk, we, re, we really can talk about the isolated agenesis of corpus callosum. It is possible to, to say uh, that expression? Well, that's a challenging. Uh, we would need another day to talk about that question, as you know better than I do. Uh, it goes in the same direction that I was pointed out in my attempt to solicit discussion on the outcome, because uh, I think uh, one way to close the, 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 the floor is a nice paper which was published a few years ago by a French group. Uh, the, the, the name is Mangione, Oliver Mangione. I don't know how it is pronounced in French. It was very interesting because I always cite it also nowadays that we are talking about going for an ixom and so on and so forth, because it was showing that uh, even though uh, you can assess as thoroughly as possible a fetus with diagnosis of the corpus callosum, or also late in pregnancy, 28, 30 weeks. So there was a brilliant neurosonodon, a brilliant MRI, and uh, the genetics testing at that time was not in including the the ICSOM, but was relying on as far as the uh, CGHRA is concerned, uh, they were showing that in 15%, 1.5% of the cases with, with uh, apparent isolated ACC uh, at that gestational age after birth, in 15% of the cases, they found out the cases to be either syndromic or with other additional uh, malformation at the same time. So that's a major percentage. And that goes uh, in the direction of the question that you just, uh, because I think that uh, uh, for the brain, uh, we do know, we do know uh, virtually anything at all, because uh, we know we have very similar lesions having two different outcomes. Very si this, this, uh, the very same lesion with two different outcomes. So it's very challenging. Uh, to make a, a counsel, counseling on this issue, not only for ACC, but for a variety, a wide range of brain malformation. That's a major point. Thank you, Dario. Uh, we have to, to stop here. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, let me share with you this an amazing session regarding to fetal neurology, Dario. It's my pleasure to be here with you, Mauricio, my friend, and with everybody at Iswok. And together with Mauricio, we will uh, be happy to receive by email uh, any other question that we do not have time to answer to uh, due to the short time allotted to discussion. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the course. Okay, of course, Dario, thank you. Uh, I have to introduce uh, the session, the next session, the session nine, and it's uh, regarding to use the ultrasound for the management of uh, postpartum hemorrhage with uh, two amazing uh, professors uh, from Germany, Professor Henrich, and uh, from Nigeria, uh, Professor Galadansi. Uh, thank you for your attention and go ahead. Thank you so much.